Um, so today we're going to be talking about uh, kind of analytical formulation of machine learning problems, uh, as well as looking a little bit about, at um, the baselines and kind of what you would be comparing your, your models against. Um, so let's see, right, if you want to jump to the next slide. Uh, um, so, you know, we'll start off kind of talking through analytic formulation and we've already talked a bit about scoping and kind of the idea of how you think about defining your project um, and the goals and, and actions that are involved. And, and scoping is really kind of at uh, a high level, like what's the goal of the project? What's the, the organization uh, that you're working with trying to, um, trying to achieve and, and how they're thinking about achieving it. The analytic formulation kind of takes that scope and maps it onto a machine learning problem um, or you know, particular analytical approach. So now we're kind of getting uh, closer to the data and the analysis that, that you'll be doing. Um, so you know, really where the scope is high level and, and kind of um, a little bit more general, the analytic formulation is much more detailed and, and as specific as possible because the the idea is right I want to take that and figure out this is you know this is how I'm going to code it up and if you do a good job of, of writing your analytic formulation it's obvious what you you know what code you're going to go sit in front of the computer and write um, which is not the the sort of easy task to do from scoping uh, and so you know one way to detect kind of um, gaps in your formulation is if you go and you know um, five different people could code this up in five different ways, uh, you know, you want to um, kind of tighten it up a little bit. Yep. Um, That's an important point because y your scope can turn into many, many, many formulations, right? There are, the scope isn't going to be conc um, concrete enough that it's going to uniquely map to a formulation. You can have 10 different formulations that are all valid, that all fit the scope, but they are more or less achievable given the data that you have or one of them is harder to do, one of them might take longer. So, so here, what really the point is to go from scope to a much more uniquely defined set of decisions that you have to make in order to turn it into an ML problem. And then we have all the tools we have in ML to take advantage of and, and tackle that problem. And so this is a really, really important piece and one that we often don't cover in, in, in sort of standard you know, ML classes because their problems come very well defined. You know, you've worked on a lot of projects probably for classes that says, here is your classification problem. Here is the training set, here is the test set, here is a matrix, uh, here is an evaluation metric. All of those are things that, that never come to you in a real problem defined that way. So that's kind of the goal of today is to give you sort of some of that experience in formulating that problem from the scope to making these decisions um, uh, in, in a way that's, that helps you solve the problem effectively. Yeah. And, you know, and kind of like relating to that, right? Like it, um, this last bullet point about it should always kind of be guided by how is this actually going to be used? How's it going to be deployed? Uh, the, the formulation should kind of tightly couple to that. And a lot of the decisions that you'd make in, in coding something up will relate to that. For instance, are they making a decision every day or they have a planning meeting every three months? Um, and, you know, and that'll kind of relate to how you build your features, how you think about defining your label. And so we'll get into to all those sorts of pieces. Um, but the, those are, are things that, uh, that are kind of at a, you know, general level, um, what, what distinguishes the formulation from the scope, because I, I think that's, they're, they're kind of easy to mix up as, as well, because um, they're both a little bit about problem definition. Uh, but this is really about, you know, what the, the machine learning problem you're going to be um, delving into is. Uh, so to make things a little bit more concrete, I think we're going to try to talk, and, and this is why we have kind of this uh, whiteboard panel next to the, the slides here. Um, so we're, we're going to try to, to talk through a problem that we've actually worked on, um, which is uh, really kind of looking at um, trying to use mental health outreach to help sort of break the cycle of incarceration. Uh, this is something that we've been doing with um, uh, Johnson County in Kansas uh, and their, um, uh, what they have called the mobile crisis response team. Uh, so a, a team of uh, people with the county who um, try to help 
uh, provide mental health resources to uh, effectively people in crisis. Um, and uh, and one you know one place that that they uh, work with is in the criminal justice system. People who are cycling in and out um, of that system often have a pretty severe um, uh, kind of mental health uh, challenges, um, and they're hoping that uh, intervening sort of earlier can can help kind of break the cycle of of people uh, coming in and out of jail. Um, so, so thinking we'll, we'll, about kind of our you know last week's conversation in scope, what's what's our kind of what's the goal and what are the actions that we've kind of implied in this in this problem statement? Yeah, no, that's a good way to kind of like drill down. You know, so right, if we, if we were um, scoping this right, the goal would be uh, to reduce sort of reincarceration. Um, uh, yep. Um, and, you know, and the actions that they're taking are uh, mental health outreach. Um, and in, in practice, right, this is uh, uh, basically looking at uh, either doing phone calls, door knocks, uh, at least door knocks kind of pre-COVID, um, uh, and, you know, even mailers, things like that, to try to um, Get in touch with people who have, you know, been out of the system for a little while, um, and and see if they need uh, any help that might be kind of proactive um, rel relative to something happening that that lands them back in jail. Um, so how do we scope? How do we kind of take that scope and now turn it into a, an ML problem? Turn it into a formulation. Um, yeah, uh, well, so, I, you know, next slide is right there. There are kind of a lot of, or several decisions that we need to make uh, that kind of map into, you know, how we would um, turn this into uh, a code or, or, you know, a machine learning analysis. And the very first one is, is just what type of analysis um, are you even doing? Uh, so, you know, um, what kind of analysis are we doing here? Uh, and actually, you could jump to the next slide, right, which kind of lists out, you know, Right, maybe we're doing classification, maybe we're doing description, maybe we're doing prediction. Um, and, you know, where Ray was talking about earlier, uh, you know, one single scope can map to many different types of analysis, many different types of um, uh, kind of ML formulations. Um, this is kind of where you see that in, in practice, right? You could imagine uh, one direction this sort of formulation could take of being asked, like, well, what, you know, what, what are some of the other things that are happening with these people uh, who are cycling in and out of jail a lot um, and, you know, maybe have history of, of mental health need? Um, and that might be more of a descriptive task, right? We might be doing some clustering on, on the existing data, looking for, for kind of correlates, things like that. Um, or even just if we, if we wanted to better understand what types of people tend to come back to jail repeatedly? Uh, what are the characteristics of those people so that we can better understand um, that, that population before we even do anything? That, that, that's, you know, that's, a, that's a description task, right? Where we would use a lot of descriptive and supervised approaches to better understand th those characteristics of people that get saying. Um, right, and, and that can go two directions, right? That might be the first kind of exploratory data analysis phase of another project that's that's doing some of these other tasks. Um, or it might be kind of the, the focus of the project and maybe would inform, well, we're thinking about, you know, developing new um, new approaches or, or new resources that are, are kind of targeted at certain needs that are out there in the population. And we kind of need to understand uh, what's, what's going on with them. Um, so, you know, this, uh, Right, this, this particular scope might turn into more of a, a descriptive project. Um, I, if it was, you know, a classification project, uh, you could think of it as, um, right, trying to classify people who maybe do or, or don't have mental health needs. Um, and, you know, and I guess you could kind of think of this sort of at the border of classification detection, right, where there you're looking at sort of the existing population, not trying to predict anything in the future, but just trying to understand uh, what, you know, 
what's kind of happening with the, the existing population, what the needs are uh, that are already there. Yeah, um, and I think if you're sort of thinking about just that detection or classification problems, right, like take what's happening right now, right, with, with COVID and a lot of people that are working on the area, it's not about prediction tasks to figure out what's happening in the future. It's really detecting what is the, the actual you know, rate of infection today. There is no prediction happening there. And so just like that, the, the, the same example of what Kit's giving is, you know, if, if the question we were being asked was you know, the, the rate of mental health needs, what, what are the mental health needs? What are the people who have mental health needs um, that are currently in jail or that have just been released from jail? Um, or used to be in jail. Those are, again, that's a detection problem and we can formulate that in a different way. But, but the, the key is sort of this question, what, are, what is the initial point, right? Is it to better understand uh, what's happened? Is it to better understand the current state and, and kind of detect what's happening? Or is it something about the future, um, which you might think about, you know, uh, if the question was, you know, who are the people that are going to come back to uh, to jail, who, how, which of the people who have a high risk of recidivism, that's now a future looking problem, right? That's the formulation where now prediction makes sense, whereas in the previous formulation, the prediction wasn't, the goals pr prediction wasn't really uh, a piece there. But now if I ask you, you know, can you help me figure out who's going to come back to jail uh, in the future? Now we can, now the formulation could be a, a, a prediction formulation. Um, yeah, and there's of course an element of that in the the goal that um, we described. Uh, you know, thinking about the scope as well, right? Um, because they are trying to distribute these mental health services in you know kind of in the service of reducing um, pe you know reincarceration of people coming back to jail. Um, so there is kind of a natural prediction problem uh, to do there. Um, but there, it you know the next kind of couple pieces are, are optimization and, and causal inference, um, but both of which are, are quite relevant here as, as well, uh, right? Because, um, you know, like any social service, uh, the MCRT, right, only has limited resources. They can only reset, reach out to a relatively small fraction of, of people, either who are, are just kind of coming out of jail or who've been in jail in, in kind of recent history. Um, they're they're trying to use those resources most effectively to you know provide mental health um, services to people with need who uh, might go back to jail. And that statement I just made, um, there's a lot of causality in there, right? Uh, you know, to what extent will providing mental health services um, have a causal impact on reducing somebody's chance of of ending up in jail? And who are the the individuals for whom? Uh, that action um, might have the, the largest impact on, uh, on reducing um, their, their recidivism rate. Uh, that, you know, that kind of causal analysis is very important uh, to, to achieving this goal. Um, and, and so you, you can kind of see, right, that, you know, the, the scope that we wrote down could be turned into, you know, a, an analytical formulation that uh, falls into any of these buckets. And in, in reality, will often become an analytical formulation that has elements of, of many of these buckets. Uh, so even if we're, we're thinking about, you know, maybe the prediction problem in the shorter term, well, we have to start with some description and, and understand the data um, and, and think about how we're going to build uh, features. Um, but then as we want to go and deploy it, uh, and think about, you know, doing a field trial, we'll be doing um, some causal inference. And as we're building our model and thinking about uh, kind of design choices and, and decisions that we're going to make there, optimization is going to play a very large role as well, because we'll be thinking about their resource constraints uh, and, you know, not trying to maybe create a model that will um, predict gel recidivism uh, you know, if we use a, a threshold of 0.5 and, and just say, well, you know, more likely than, than not to, to recidivate, um, but rather saying, oh, we're going to try to predict, build a prediction model um, where the, you know, 100 most uh, likely, the 100 highest risk um, with the model, um, you know, kind of performs as, as well as possible uh, if they're going to, to um, 
focus on, on those people for the mental health services. But then if we're going to do that, we're making some causal assumptions uh, about the fact that those are the 100 people who uh, would benefit most um, from the, the outreach. Uh, and, and so in, in practice and, and the way this has, uh, you know, happened in, in reality um, is, right, we, we kind of ended up choosing to, to focus on the prediction task as kind of the immediate analytic formulation, building predictive models of, of gel recidivism among a specific uh, set of individuals, and we'll talk about the cohort, uh, I think, next. Um, but then designing a field trial that helps try to answer some of these causal inference questions uh, about where kind of within that, that model um, would be the, the most effective place to intervene. And then uh, as they start to think about deployment, um, trying to, to use that, that field trial to, to answer those questions. Um, so you're so you're basically sort of saying that in some ways we, we you know, you're saying we started off thinking about it as a description. First step was really kind of understanding who are the people who have been affected by recidivism, who have mental health issues, and, and kind of really understanding the past. Then we sort of looked at as a as a classification problem to filter the people who have mental health needs. Um, and then we really looked at it as a prediction problem to predict, you know, off this set of people who have mental health needs, what is their risk of, of, of coming back to jail? Um, but that's not enough because now we know high risk people who have mental health needs um, who, are, who are likely to come back to jail. Now we wanna figure out how to reduce their risk of coming back to jail. So then um, we sort of ran field trials to kind of figure out causal inference things to make sure that we can link this prediction task for these people to actually reducing their risk um, so it kind of became all of the, these, and, and then there's an optimization piece of, of selecting how do we allocate the resources that we have, the mental health resources. And so we kind of did everything in, in this, in a, in a project, but it's everything was done over a period of multiple years. Yes. It's not that they were all happening in parallel, um, where we really did start with a little bit of description stuff. Um, little bit of, of, of classification. We really spent a lot of time on the prediction piece. Um, and so almost like this was the phase one of the project. And then phase two really was um, focusing on causal inference and running, running these, these field trials. Um, and so maybe what we wanna do for now is kind of focus on, and, and by the way, that, that's, this is a pretty common scenario, right? It, in most projects we care about changing something, um, right? Whether it's changing recidivism rate or changing graduation rates or changing voter turnout or, um, you know, changing uh, uh, how facilities comply with environmental based regulations, like all the projects that we're doing in class. So the, and whenever we're thinking about sort of what do we do some, to change something, eventually our task is probably gonna be some form of causal inference, not every time, but, but a lot of the times, but we can't get there directly. We kind of need, because we often don't have the data and we don't have the experiments. And, and so we're gonna sort of focus today on, on kind of this task on, on the prediction piece for, for this recidivism problem. Um, but keeping in mind that, that that's not the end goal in itself. It, um, it's, it's a way to get to the end goal, which, which we'll, we'll, we'll come back to. Yep, no, that, that's totally right. And, and we like really need to keep in mind, you know, there's a lot of assumptions in that arrow um, that, that you're drawing. And I think, you know, it, like as you're thinking about class projects as well, right? You only have several months to, to kind of do those projects and, you know, and you don't have the, the ability to, to go out and run a, a full field trial um, and collect uh, kind of robust data for, for causal inference. Um, so you're probably going to, you know, have to back off that a little bit, but in doing so, you're making some assumptions about, well, the people who are at high risk for this would be the, the right ones to, to intervene with. And, and th those assumptions should be um, very clear and very explicit uh, and, and not just kind of hidden. Um, so, you know, I, I think we, we kind of go through this to, to make that explicit and make sure that that's out there. Um, but yeah, and then we'll, we'll kind of talk about, you know, phase one. Well, the data, you know, isn't available to, to make inferences about 
um, who mental health resources would most most help uh, uh, kind of prevent coming back to jail. So um, let's focus on the prediction problem of who's most likely to come back to jail, uh, and then can kind of measure um, measure from there. Right. So what you just sort of said was, you know, what what that we're going to focus on the prediction problem, and the prediction problem is who is likely to come back to jail. Um, so that's that's kind of how you're formulating the, the, the prediction problem for this task um, is can we build a system that tells us who's likely to come back to jail? Um, is that for, for, it sort of seems very, very, uh, kind of broadly defined, right? Is it, um, do we have to make any other decisions or, or is that is that a unique enough uh, ML formulation that we can go and start building models? Well, yeah, so if I, if I was gonna go, you know, start cutting this up, right? <laughs> um, you know, the, the first uh, kind of piece, and if you jump to the next slide, right, um, would be like, uh, well, you know, who is who? <laughs> Right, like what, what, is, what is who in that statement um, even uh, refer to? Is it everyone in the population of Johnson County? Um, is that everyone in the population of Johnson County today or who has ever lived in Johnson County? Uh, is it, um, uh, you know, we're, we're talking about coming back to jail. So implicitly in there, we're assuming it's people who've been in jail at some point point in the past um, because we're, we're thinking about recidivism so it's not everyone in the county it's it's some subset of people um, what if you were in jail 20 years ago uh, because you were um, you know at some uh, protest rally or, or something like that and you know and had no record prior and, and no record since is that somebody that we want to consider or, or maybe only people who have been recently released from jail and this is where we made the point um, earlier about uh, how is this going to be used um, comes into to play as well. If they're going to allocate their resources uh, only to people as they're exiting jail, um, our cohort and our relevant entities might be people who are being released from jail in the last you know week or month or, or however frequently they're they're making their decisions. Uh, if it's um, more about general outreach into the population. Uh, then it might be a broader cohort people who've been released from jail uh, in a little bit of a, a longer time. Um, in the actual project, uh, right, this um, was actually looking at um, more general outreach into a population, and we chose to look at people who've been released from jail in the last three years. Um, but uh, the other element of this, and, and thinking about kind of the relevant entities and, and cohort, uh, was also um, the the fact that uh, here we were allocating mental health resources, and we we kind of wanted to to think a little bit about uh, you know Ray kind of mentioned right we did some description some classification some prediction, uh, so we also kind of wanted to restrict our cohort to people who we thought had some um, existing or or higher uh, indication of need. Uh, in the data. And so we looked for, for individuals with some um, kind of broadly defined uh, indications of, of mental health need in the past. Um, and won't get into to too much of the details of, of the data, but there were some kind of mental health assessments, uh, some assessments that people take when they come into jail um, that were useful there. We also uh, had available data um, from ambulance runs and, and things like that, where uh, the EMTs that were responding um, were uh, kind of making some assessment of the situation. Um, and so, uh, so we had many different data sources that, that had um, some assessment and information about uh, whether people had um, some mental health issues uh, that we included substance abuse, th anything like that, that, um, that the, the MCRT um, might be able to, to help somebody out with. Uh, now that, that's one, making a causality assumption um, and two, you know, potentially uh, restricting the population um, where we might be able to, again, from an optimization perspective, 
focus resources on where we have some signal that, that there's larger need. Um, but of course, that, that might mean that there are um, some people who don't fit that criteria uh, who, um, uh, who, who do have need uh, that, that may be missed. Um, and then I guess I'll just mention, you know, as a, as a third bit, uh, we're looking at people who have been in jail in Johnson County in the last three years, released, have some prior history of need, and who currently, uh, whose most recent address in the data is in Johnson County. And if you go back to kind of some of our discussion about uh, record linkage and, and bias and fairness, we had to think hard about um, uh, people, uh, you know, who have lots of uh, movement um, or, or who um, are marked as homeless in the, in the data and, and how to handle them. Uh, here, we, we ended up choosing to, to be more inclusive um, and, and generally including them. Um, when, when they were homeless, uh, because we, we couldn't distinguish whether they were still in Johnson County or not. Right, so, so kind of the idea was that we're, we're starting with who is likely to, you know, that was sort of our starting question, right, starting formulation. And now we've kind of refined it um, quite a bit, right now we're saying off all the people, <laughs> Um, who um, have been in jail in Johnson County, because that's kind of all we know, um, in the last three years, and um, have some indication of mental health needs, and uh, most recent address is in Johnson County, because if they don't live there, then we can't really do outreach. It's not that they don't need the help. It's that for this, and that's where what's important is how this system will be deployed, right? If the system is going to be deployed nationwide, then, then this we don't care about this. Um, but if the system is gonna be deployed where the jurisdiction this county has to, to provide mental health outreach is only for people who live there, um, then we are going to have to do this, this restriction. Um, but now sort of this who has been transformed into this, this definition, which is sort of our cohort. Um, and the implications of this, they're sort of downstream implications again. So remember, we're going we're gonna to build a prediction model, right? And we're going to then predict people. And, and so this is both kind of for, has implications on our training set, right? And on our test set. Um, so this is kind of the, the, the first question we have to figure out is, you know, what are the relevant entities? In this case, it's really people. Um, but then what is that cohort? Um, and, and this is the definition. And this is not, again, this is very specific. And that's kind of the level we need to get to. Um, um, you know, even things like have been in jail, well, in jail in Johnson County, given the data that we have, um, like, so they're gonna, there's going to be, you know, again, some ambiguities here. How, how long do they have to be in jail for? A, a day? Is that enough to put them in the cohort? And for now, we're saying yes, because we haven't specified a, a limit, right? Same for mental health needs. We have different indications, and we have more or less confident. Same for the most recent address. Let's say the most recent one was five years ago. Um, should we still include them? I don't know. And, and so some of it, as we talked about last time, is, some of this formulation is going to vary as we look at the data uh, and as we do analysis and as we even do intervention, because we might find out that a lot of the people who had old addresses, they go and do outreach to them and they can't find them. And we might need to do the transformation. But what we kind of went from who to all of this, right? Um, so now is, are we good to build a model now that we have this definition or do we still have to figure out anything else? I mean, I think we still have to figure out, you know, uh, a little bit about uh, kind of what our, our label is and, and how we're, you know, making predictions. Oh, I mean, I guess we had some other details about uh, cohort definition here. Um, so I guess zooming, you know, zooming back out quickly, um, uh, right? So we, we went from, you know, who to this, you know, very kind of detailed specific thing that Ray mentioned, you know, they're There'd be some other decisions to make, but this is this is much closer to something that I could go sit down and, and write some logic um, in you know SQL or, or Python to to identify. 
Um, and here, right, just wrote, you know, we're kind of thinking about active entities in, in some case. Um, so not, not necessarily everyone that exists, um, but, uh, but the, the entities that, you know, the individuals in this case that, um, that kind of have, are, are relevant and, um, and still, uh, you know, kind of in the system. Um, another uh, way, and, and I think we, we mentioned this briefly, right, might be uh, if the system was being deployed to, say, offer services uh, to people as they exited jail, um, it might be more of an event-based uh, sort of definition. And there you would just look at, you know, uh, the who would just be people who are being released, maybe who have an address in Johnson County. And um, uh, although in that case, actually, you'd probably roll back the address in Johnson County because, you know, they're already in Johnson County Jail and you have access to them. Um, but probably would would still have kind of the mental health need. Maybe you would focus more acutely on the mental health assessments in that period of stay in jail than a than a broader question. Um, though again, that would be something that you would probably talk over with the um, you know with the partner organization. In this case, with the, the Johnson County uh, Mental Health Center. Um, so you know these are again the same scope could lead to many different cohorts um, and, you know, different projects. Um, even, uh, I'd say, groups working on the same project in class uh, may end up with different cohorts and, and kind of different formulations. Um, but yeah, we're, you know, so even once we've chosen our cohort, we're still not done, uh, right? We, um, so we figured out, I guess, you know, one was actually, uh, the you know type of analysis and, and two was kind of cohort. Um, so we know we're doing a prediction problem uh, and um, a prediction problem that's informed by uh, some classification and some description. Um, and we, we've chosen you know this kind of detailed cohort. Um, yep. So you know now let's think a little bit about our label um, and let's see. Oh yeah that's pretty good. Um, mental health, two years, mental health, health, Johnson County, uh, yeah, release, so, uh, you know, now we're, now we're trying to predict who's going to come back to jail with all these, you know, uh, and, and meets all these, these criteria. Um, are we looking at how, like, is it, are they ever going to come back to jail until in, in, in their lifetime? Because that's a very, very, very long time to predict things for, uh, or do we want to limit that to to some some shorter window? If um, so, if you jump to the next slide, uh, so you know, and, and actually, right, that's that's kind of the next two questions together. Um, but yeah, we we need to think about you know what's the outcome we care about, uh, and and then kind of what's the um, the time horizon uh, that that we're thinking about. Um, and, and we can kind of discuss both of these together because they are very uh, interrelated, right? If we, um, if we do try to predict somebody coming back to jail, you know, from now to, to kind of their entire lifetime, uh, we're going to run into some, you know, serious challenges with, with data um, and, you know, and might end up, right, basically having, uh, depending on how far back our data goes, nobody that, that we can actually, you know, use to, to model. So there, there are kind of um, some uh, constraints just on our ability to, to build a system that, that might um, inform the time horizon. I, I think the schools project in class might actually uh, run into that. Um, but then there, there are also, you know, kind of practical considerations that way, but also um, considerations, and again, this kind of comes back to some of the assumptions we make about causal inference of, well, is an intervention now going to, you know, have an impact 20 years in the future, or is it more likely to have an impact in the next six months or, or a year or, or something like that? Um, and this will also be heavily informed by uh, description as you look at the data and say, well, among people who, who do come back, what's kind of the, the frequency at which they, they tend to come back? Um, and is it, you know, that, that they're likely to land back in jail um, more, more quickly or, uh, or further out? There is some nuance to number three as well, um, and we don't need to get into the details too much here, but there are actually a lot of reasons why you might end up back in jail um, after you see a release in the data. And some of those are simply things like um, 
you were, you know, booked into jail and then posted bail or, or released on your own recognizance awaiting trial. And then you come to trial and you're convicted and, and you um, end up back in jail again. Um, and this can be like a major source of, of leakage where if you're using those as, as your label, um, that's, uh, that's not really kind of a, a new thing. That's, that's just the, the result of um, the, the kind of existing, uh, um, you know, the, the previous booking actually um, relates to, to this one. It's, it's not that, that something new happened, that there was a, a new uh, uh, arrest made that landed you back in jail. And so in, in this case, right, the, the label would be, um, you know, book, jail bookings associated with, uh, you know, arrests for, for new crimes. Um, and, you know, the time horizon uh, in, in the actual project, we ended up choosing a year. Um, and that was based on a combination of, of kind of our data exploration and conversations uh, with the partner and, and understanding um, you know, kind of how they were thinking about, uh, about and, it. You know, we're here also, the, the outcome, the reason sort of outcomes and labels are not the same things, right? Labels are things that we need to train our model. Outcomes are things that we care about in the real world. And, and we're gonna, the, the, there, there's a reading for, for the class that we're gonna do, right? And that's gonna talk about how different, the, we, 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 we often don't have, um, exact outcomes uh, that we can we can predict. So we use proxies um, as labels, and the proxy you choose, uh, we have a choice of using a lot of different proxies, and the proxy you choose could have uh, implications on what your model learns. Uh, so so that's something to be conscious about: is where the label in the best case is you know some noisy uh, approximation of an outcome, but in the worst case, it's it's a proxy that that is in some ways biased um, and, and we're using it because we might not have a choice, but we have to be conscious about what were the different labels you could use? Which ones are you choosing to use? What are the implications of using that label uh, on your analysis? Um, and then same for the, the how far out, right? So Kit sort of mentioned 20 years might be too much because it, you know, um, but, but what if we, we sort of just said, I'm gonna predict for the next, next minute if you're gonna, if you're gonna come back to jail, well, sure, I could probably I could build a model to do that. But the model doesn't care, right? I just give it a label, and and it it tries to build a model. It may not be very accurate, um, or it may be very accurate because it's it's running. If you run this model, the the minute before the judge uh, or or you know, um, um, sentences you in jail, or you're being transported to jail, and jail booking is gonna happen in the next minute, it's probably a pretty easy problem. Um, but the question is, the goal of the project here is to reduce their risk of a jail booking, right? reduce their risk of recidivism, which means that the time horizon has to be at least as much as it, uh, the intervention needs to be effective. Um, and, and so the, if the work, if the proactive mental health outreach that they're going to do needs a few months to actually work and reduce their risk, then then we have to be able to predict early enough for them to intervene and the inter intervention change something. Uh, and that's gonna happen again, you know, the same in, in, in the graduating on time example. You know, again, I can predict the minute before somebody is supposed to graduate if they're gonna graduate or not, but I can't change that, uh, at least without just, you know, uh, uh, fudging the numbers. Uh, but same for, you know, a lot of medical interventions. Uh, if you're gonna, figure out who is at risk of some disease so you can prevent them. Well, let's say that the prevention program is really a behavioral change program. It's going to take a couple of years, um, like, you know, diabetes, uh, to, to actually try to prevent. Then the prediction task has to match the, the intervention um, time, the time that intervention needs to be effective. Otherwise, it's, it's useless to achieve the, the, the task that we, the goal that we started with. No, I mean, that's a really good point, especially that, you know, the time horizon could be too short or it could be too long, depending on, on the context. And the, the diabetes case is a, a good example where your intervention may be working, it, but it may take two years and adverse outcomes may still happen in, in the meantime, um, even if somebody was, was kind of on, on the right track to improvement. Um, I mean, I, I think another you know, piece on, on 
the label uh, definitions and, and kind of how they mapped outcomes um, also relates back to the, the record linkage discussions uh, that we've had recently, where here, if we're trying to predict something that's going to happen about somebody, uh, you know, in, in the next year or whatever, but in the, the future in the data, um, that, you know, that's only as accurate as our ability to identify that that future booking is about the same person, uh, which in, you know, different systems, um, there are some systems we've worked with, not the, the Johnson County one, where, um, where they just kind of have each case as, as its own thing, and they don't have a unique kind of person level identifier that, that ties all the data together. And so you have to do a, a kind of reconciliation process um, even within the, the database. Um, but even in a place like Johnson County where they are trying to tie individuals together, um, right, they, that system, you know, uh, it may have its own um, uh, kind of failings, especially among, uh, you know, people who don't have IDs who are moving around a lot. Um, and maybe it's just whatever name they give uh, when, when they're picked up and, and that might be changing. Uh, so, you know, I think there's a lot to be kind of cognizant there. Um, it's, you know, it's almost never the case where you say, oh, what, you know, what's my label? Well, it's just this column and, you know, great, we're good. Uh, that, that almost never happens. Um, and even if that does happen, uh, does that map exactly to, to the outcome um, that you actually care about? And, and that's also very, very rare. So, so what's our outcome here that we have to do? So we, we, we were doing a prediction task, we have our cohort. And so what is, what is the label that, that we, we define here that we care about? Yeah, so the, the label that we ended up defining um, was a, a subsequent gel booking. Uh, it, um, so kind of three and four together is the subsequent gel booking in the next year um, uh, for a kind of associated with, uh, oh, Siri popped up. Um, in the next year associated with um, an arrest for a, a new, uh, for a, a new crime, so not you know not a not a booking associated with a, an yep. existing arrest. Um, okay. So so we we kind of we go back to who is likely to come back to jail. From there, we've gone to of all the people who have been in jail in Johnson County in the last three years, who have and have mental health needs and have a most recent address in Johnson County. Can we predict if they will have? Can we predict their likelihood or? Um, is it, can we predict their likelihood um, of a jail, a new a jail booking for a new crime in the next year? Is that our formulation then? Um, it's getting a lot closer. Um, yeah, it's, it's getting a lot longer. Uh, and a lot I don't longer. have enough space in, 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 the, in the whiteboard to, to formulate that. Um, and so, so it's basically off, so we had kind of this list, right? So we had the, we had sort of our, our analysis, we're doing a prediction, we have our cohort, we have an outcome that we care about, and then we have a time horizon for that outcome to happen. Um, do we need anything else or are we good now? Uh, I mean, we're getting a lot closer. We, you know, we do kind of need um, to think again about how this is gonna be deployed. So our, our cohort's also gonna be tied a little bit to how you know how frequently are we running uh, this prediction? So you know, are we doing this every month or um, or every year? Uh, and then it will also you know eventually tie to kind of the resource constraints as well. Um, are we trying to identify the hundred highest risk people every month, um, or are we trying to identify you know the thousand highest risk people every year? Um, or the, you know, 10 highest risk people every month or the um, 10 highest risk people who are being released from jail today. Um, so, so I think those, uh, those pieces will also come into, again, how we're going to, to code up this, this thing and how we're actually going to map it into um, a set of matrices that we're going to put into a, a machine learning uh, model. Right. But, but if, I, if I predicted their likelihood, if I actually have, you know, a probability of them coming back in the next one year with the outcome for the cohort, then I can do all of that separately, right? I can kind of just, if I get this right, then I don't need to worry about 
can they do something with 10 people, 100 people, 1,000 people? We, I have an actual accurate probability of them coming back. Uh, so so why, why worry about that at this stage? I, I mean, I guess a couple of reasons, right? We're not predicting, so, you know, predicting a, a proper probability is, is very uh, challenging. Um, and, you know, it's, it's much harder to predict a proper probability than it is uh, to predict a rank ordering a, a risk. Um, but I, I think the other piece, at least to my mind, right, is, um, you know, the, the resource constraint of am I predicting, you know, the 100 best every, every month or, or something like that, is that the best model, the best performing model for predicting the 100 best people every month might be a different model than the best performing model for predicting uh, the, you know, 1,000 uh, best people every year or the 500 best people every month. So, you know, both of those parameters changing, um, right? If we uh, go down and, you know, go sit down and, and write code to, to do this, we're going to have to go through some sort of model selection phase and figure out what model we're going to choose to deploy. And, and that's true, right? If we could exactly predict the, the probability that, you know, each person is, is going to, right? If we, if we could get it exactly right all the way across the score um, all at once, you know, then, then we would just choose that model. Uh, right. But the problem is it's, um, you know, very unlikely that you're going to get a model that, that does that exactly. Um, right. And, you know, generally, you, right. yeah. you can't really predict the actual probability. Yeah, so if we, if we could get that model, we would take that model because then that model is sort of multi-purpose. We can use it for whatever we want. Um, but most likely, any model we build to predict this likelihood, it's going to make mistakes at, at different, uh, uh, for different types of, you know, people. So it might get the top right, it might get the bottom right, uh, it might over predict for some people, under predict for some people. But if what we're trying to do is, if this model is going to be used to prioritize outreach, and as you were saying, they have capacity to, let's say, um, help 100 people a month, um, then we're asking, we're asking a, for this model to do a lot by, by making it sort of optimized for getting everybody's probability right, because it's not going to be able to do that. Um, so, so then I guess I have to change this, right? Instead of saying predict likelihood, should I then say identify the hundred highest risk people from my cohort? Is that a better formulation? Like if I say off our cohort, which is, you know, that long definition, uh, identify the high, 100 highest risk people um, who will have that outcome, um, jail booking for a new crime, in the next one year? Is that, is that kind of getting close to what we want? I think that's getting closer to what we want. I think, um, right, but you still kind of need a, a little bit of a temporal, like, each month are you identifying the 100 highest risk people? Or, you know, there, there's that bit of, of how frequently are you doing yeah. it, which will be how frequently are you um, taking action. Right. Or deciding right. about actions to take. Um, right. So, so are we deciding once, you know, there's a, once every 10 years where we decide, okay, here's 100 people we're going to help. Um, or are we sitting down every month making that decision and then giving that list to some team to do, do that outreach? Um, Okay, so, so then, okay, so then, so then we've got kind of our, again, we had our analysis, right, which we figured prediction, then we said, what's our cohort, um, and so that's, we had that, now, then we sort of said, okay, from our cohort, what are we going to do, you know, all for, you know, what is the outcome that we care about, right, so we sort of came up with the outcome or the label, then we had the time horizon for that, like how far out are we gonna predict that? And then we said, well, what are we, what are we estimating, right? What is the, the, the you know, what do we estimate? Is it, is it estimating the probability? Um, or is it estimating the top, you know, 100? Um, and then how often or more like, when do I do, I do that, right? Um, and so, so one version of that could be again, you know, so now we're saying, 
uh, what we want to do is every month, uh, at the beginning of the month, so first day of every month, um, we are going to take all the people. And so, so maybe the, how often is first of every month, um, we're going to take all the people from our cohort who have been released in the past three years, uh, have a most recent address in Johnson County, uh, and have identified mental health needs. Um, we are going, of all of those, we're going to estimate um, the, the 100 highest risk people who are likely to have uh, a jail booking for a new crime in the next 12 months. Uh, that's a lot. Um, but it's also very specific. And, and it seems like we should be able to, you know, take all of that and, and build something that then gets used for a very specific task, right? So then it's going to help this Johnson County plan every month, generate this list, give this list to uh, mental health outreach people who are then going to do an intervention. We can sort of start building a system that actually gets used for this task. Um, but that requires, you know, again, if we go back a few few pages, right, we started with, with actually, we started with, with, with an even broader question, right? The bigger, a broader question was, uh, and that's kind of what, what, how the, these projects start is, hey, we have, and we want to use mental health services to reduce jail recidivism. Um, and from there, we got to the scope and the goal and um, who's likely to come back to jail, but then that wasn't enough because it was, it was underdefined, ill-defined. Um, and then we kept going and going and going, and, and then I guess we we come over here where we start. We sort of have this much more operational view of the problem um, because this model again is not a general purpose model that can be used anywhere. It's customized for the way this this problem is going to be solved. Um, yeah, and and kind of you know to the like, what's the point? Um, Right, like th there are two, you know, really um, big uses of, of this, uh, you know, one, one's kind of more for you of when, you know, once you've done, gone through this exercise, sitting down and kind of, you know, coding this up, um, a lot of those decisions have already sort of been, been sorted out. Um, but two is if you had just taken the scope, sat down, coded something up, um, and then, you know, tried to go back to the partner and said, you know, wrote all this code, <laughs> Uh, you might have, you know, you might have made those decisions or, or, or come up with, you know, um, ideas about how to, to structure the machine learning problem that might not quite match um, how, you know, how they're thinking about it or, or the actual way that they're going to use this. And so by putting this down in, in words and making all those decisions explicit, then you can kind of go back and, and iterate with the, the partner and figure out, oh, this is, um, how we're thinking about it, how we're going to use it. And it, it's kind of, you know, almost um, a, like Rosetta Stone for, you know, mapping between uh, the code that you're going to write um, and the, the way that they think about the problem, um, even if they, you know, uh, can't sit down and, and look at your code and, um, and, and see how that mapping happens. So it's, um, you know, really a very critical piece of making sure that you're going to build something that's actually going to be uh, useful and you know and be able to be deployed and and used. Um, so you're yeah. just uh, trying to write out the the analytic formulation. Yeah, because that's what we want everybody to do for their project, right? So when you're doing uh, this for your project, um, this is what we want you to write down, right? Um, because you're going to have sort of this is on the on the first day of every month, on the first on the first day of every week, or every day, or every year. So you're going to have to kind of figure out this piece. You're going to have to figure out what is your cohort, and that's sort of our cohort here. And then what are you actually estimating? Is it an actual probability? Is it a likelihood? Is it a top hundred list? Is it a top thousand list? Is it three hundred? And then what is the outcome? Which is the outcome is have a jail booking for a new crime, um, and how far out? in the next 12 months, in the next one year, right? So you're going to have to define all of these different things for your own projects 
And that's where even if you're working on the same broad project, so you can have four or five teams, right, working on a broad project, each team could have a different, different combination of these things. Um, you could have different variations on, on this. You could have different variations on this. You could have a different, vari something here, something here. Your cohort could change. So you could have lots of different combinations of these that could result in hundreds and hundreds of projects on the same general goal. Um, so that's something to sort of keep in mind as you're thinking about your project. Yeah, totally. Um, and, and, you know, you're going to write down, right, you're going to write down your, your, your scope, you're going to write down kind of your formulation, um, and then you're going to, you know, work on the project, and this will probably change. Uh, and in real projects, you know, this, this does change, the scope changes over time. These are, are you know, iterative processes as, as you learn more, both about the data, the context, um, uh, the, you know, the resources and the needs. Uh, so, you know, it's, um, uh, it, it's not, it's not a bad thing if, you know, if you write something down and then you find yourself revisiting it later, uh, that's, you know, you shouldn't be thinking about that as, as a problem or you did something, you know, wrong at the, the outset. It just means that you've learned more um, and, you know, continue to understand the context better. Okay. Um, yeah, so I think that sort of wraps up the, um, the formulation piece, right? And so here were the different pieces um, and you should all be thinking about how to apply this to your own project. So the second piece we want to talk about is, uh, you know, as you're building models uh, and trying to um, think about something that, that might actually get used and deployed, uh, you have to think about, <coughs> excuse me, um, what are you going to compare that model against? What is good? Uh, and um, and what is bad? And and there are a couple of ways to, to think about this problem. Um, I think the main one kind of grounds yourself in, you know, if the partner organization is putting out resources to build and deploy and maintain a, a complicated machine learning system, uh, you know, frankly, it should do better than they could kind of do otherwise, right? Um, better than they might do with some sort of heuristic or just kind of, you know, sort ordering on, on something that somebody who knows the context and, and works in it might kind of come with, up with, oh, I think these are the ones that, that we should really, uh, you know, these are the students who are at, at the, the biggest risk um, of, of dropping out of school or, um, or these are the people who are at the highest risk of um, of returning to jail in the, the Johnson County uh, context that we've been talking about, uh, right? They, you know, the kind of domain experts will have some, you know, some hypotheses about uh, how you would do that. Um, and, and in most cases are probably already doing something to today, unless it's a totally new, you know, intervention and, and project. Um, and so you should be comparing your, your models uh, against that and not just against, um, you know, kind of, what, what would happen if we, you know, chose people at random or, or you know, some kind of, uh, you know, prior or base rate assumption. And, and I think that's, so. a, that's a good point, right? Because our goal here is to solve this problem. We care about the problem first. So we want to make sure that we're, whatever we're proposing um, is, is effective for solving this, this problem. And our hypothesis is that um, our machine learning approach is, is, is a good uh, approach to solving it, but we don't know that yet, right? So, so while normally you'd say, you know, a lot of the ML things, well, what do we do, right? We, we have a bit random baseline and that's useful. You should at least beat the random baseline. But as Kit said, the organization that you're working with, whether internal or external, if you didn't exist, they wouldn't randomly do things, right? So think about it like, if you didn't exist, what would they do? Um, and you should be able to do better than that. And if you can't, um, then the recommendation should be, I, this model that I've built is not the model that you probably want to use right now without further investigation. And that's a perfectly fine recommendation if that's what the, 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 the results actually show. So again, in your projects, it's perfectly fine at the end to say, unfortunately, the data we had and the formulation we had and the intervention we were supporting, we don't recommend using this model right now. Um, and so the question is, how do we compare this model? What do we compare our model that we're building to? Uh, what are reasonable baselines? Um, and then how do we 
construct some of those baselines? How do we how do we set up the setups? How do we have a setup that allows us to compare a model to to those baselines? I guess um, you know it's probably also worth mentioning for maybe some of the ML people, uh, you know, and, and I think something that we saw a little bit last uh, year. Um, I think you know on some of the sort of synthetic data sets or, or the standard data sets that are out there, you're very used to like I build a model and I'm getting like an AUC of you know 0.95, um, and you know sort of two two things with that. You know one we'll talk about uh, a lot later. Uh, you know if we if we care about you know performance in the top 100 AUC, we probably don't care about. But two. Um, you know, you may find, right, performances, maybe precision at, at 100 of like 0.35 or something like that. And, you know, and, and I think some of the students last semester were really disappointed in their models. Oh, my precision's, you know, only 35%. Model's terrible. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. And then you say, well, the prior, right, the base rate is, you know, 3%, right, of um, uh, maybe of I don't remember the prior and like the, the student um, uh, uh, kids graduating. Um, but, you know, if it's something like that, then 35% is, you know, more than a, an order of magnitude improvement. So, you know, comparing against, right, what, what the prior is and then comparing against and maybe, you know, what the school administrators could have done on their own, say, just ranking by grades or something like that uh, would have been at, you know, 10 or 12 percent or, or something like that. So you're still a, a threefold improvement, even though, you know, by, by kind of maybe your, your standards of, well, I, I should have, you know, 90 percent performance um, or, or better, right, you're, you're uh, doing um, very poorly. So something can still be very, very usable, even though, you know, effectively it's wrong uh, more, more often than it's right. Um, so I think that's just worth mentioning. Uh, so don't, don't get too freaked out if you're uh, if your, you know, precision is, uh, is not necessarily, you know, 99.5 or something. Right. Um, so, yeah. So, so let's think about sort of some, some options for, for baseline, right? So clearly there, there is a random baseline and we just sort of assume that you will do that because that's the bare minimum. Um, but if you only do the random baseline, then you're going to fail this class. Um, so one, one other point there, sorry, just to interject. Yeah. Um, we're going to say random baseline a lot we don't mean a single random draw. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and this is something, you know, it's, it's easy just to like do random once. And um, no, what, what we mean is the prior or the base rate or the expected value of what would happen if, if you, you know, took, a, you know, however many random draws based on the, the distribution of the data. Um, and, and so, yeah, so, you know, two, right? Like the random baseline is not 50-50. Um, and it's and it's not a, a single draw. It's the you know it. We really should kind of say prior base rate. Yeah. Some you know, somewhere random according to the, the label distribution, right? So for yeah, if, if we've been talking about the Johnson County of mental health and recidivism, let's say in our cohort, on average, twenty percent of the people came back to jail within the next twelve months. Then the precision baseline precision at hundred, which is sort of one of the things we're going to measure, right? because we're identifying the top 100 people, the baseline is going to be 20%, the random baseline. And that's the, the, the distribution of the label. You know, class one is 20%, class zero is 80%. Uh, and so if your precision is 10, that's pretty horrible because just um, telling, just saying you know, um, uh, yes to everyone gets you 20% precision. Uh, and if your precision is 40, that's great. You're doing twice as, at least great at first glance without looking at anything else because you're doing twice as well as, as, as the random baseline we're talking about, right? And, and it, it may be that the other ones also do similarly, but that's, yeah, when, it's a good point. When we say random, um, we mean according to the distribution of your, of your data um, and you should be able to compute that analytically. You should be doing random draws. Yeah. And, and we will say random a lot. <laughs> Um, like it, it's it kind of just the way we, we think about it, but um, um, but but as you said, the, is, is you know the 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 the, the mental health um, uh, office and and the and the Department of Corrections in Johnson County, if we didn't exist, they're not going to just randomly go and 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 try to provide mental health services to people, right? They're going to use some heuristics, whether it's based on their experience 
whether that's based on prior research on what kinds of people are likely uh, to to come back to jail, um, and and you know whether they do that. To, so so the one question is sort of you know what are kind of some heuristics that you would use? What is sort of if you were just looking at uh, this data or or working on this problem, what will be a heuristic you would use to kind of say you know maybe I should compare against that, right? Um, yep. And so and Johnson. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Well, I mean, in, in Johnson County, right, like, or, or in kind of jail um, uh, reincarceration problems, uh, you know, the longer somebody's been out uh, without coming back, the, the sort of least likely that they, they are, you know, to, to come back. So you might look at days since, you know, last release uh, or something. Or like even, that. I mean, even simpler, right? So in general, one of the things we find in any behavioral problem is if you've done something before, if it's something happened before, it's going to happen again. So it, maybe like even I start simply and, and say, can I sort people by a uh, number of prior jail uh, bookings? Yeah. Right? Like that seems to me right. like if I didn't know anything about the world, this might not be a good or you know, this might be pretty bad. This might be pretty good, but if it, it's it's like any other behavior that that we have, right? So that's probably the first baseline you want to have. With now, some behaviors don't happen repeatedly, right? If you sort of say, "Who's gonna die of X tomorrow?" Well, let's count the number of times they've died before. Uh, like that's not, that's not gonna happen, right? Um, so some things only happen kind of once, but events that are that repeat, that's a useful baseline with lots of issues, and we're going to cover you know some of the issues with this this baseline. But but that's that's kind of a simple one um, that you should you should always include. Um, and then the one yeah the kid you were mentioning, which is you know you might have sort of other heuristics that 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 have shown up in research, which is you know number of days um, since last release. Um, and that, that could be a useful one. There are other, you know, if you look at literature, you're going to see other, like, you know, the, the, the first time you, you were booked in jail, the, um, and again, some of these are systemic issues. And, and again, we're going to come back to that, but, but those are sort of heuristics that you might want to use as, as, as baselines, um, that are kind of common sense baselines, um, that can be done pretty easily. You don't need to know any machine learning. You just need to be able to sort uh, and have 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 this data. Um, yeah, and uh, this is one place you know as you're getting into your projects where you you might want to be looking a little bit at um, some of the data that or you know some of the research that's out there, right? Don't don't just look at the machine learning research, but you know kind of understand some of the either sociology or um or you know kind of social science around uh these projects and contexts as well as good and one nice thing about looking at these things is that you not only sort of show improvement over the current practice but they might be useful features for you to use in your models later so so anything that's kind of known in prior research um even if you can do better you want to still use them as features and that's going to be a really important set of features Probably the more important features anyway that are going to be in your model are going to come from these this 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 prior work, right? Um, so the other piece to kind of make sure is that again, you're if you're doing this work with an organization, is you know you want to understand how are they doing today, um, what outreach methods are they using today, and 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 how are they choosing those? And sometimes they might just say, oh, we just sort of randomly pick people, uh, or they might say. Well, we pick people who were, you know, um, we actually don't, we just sort of go to everyone who's been released in the last couple of days and, and go talk to them. Um, and so that's not necessarily, uh, uh, that doesn't give you a direct way to have a baseline, but you can use that to implement, like you could write some code that says, what if I did that? What if I replicated what they did? What would my precision be? What would my recall be? What would my AUC be if I did what they did? Right. So you'd have to kind of replicate their process and 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 use it as a model, as a baseline model. And the reason that's really useful is that you can then show them: here's what you do today. It results in this metric. Here's what we have come up with, 
and it has hopefully you know, a, a, a higher performance. So it allows you to sort of show comparison to what they're doing um, and then show hopefully improvement. Um, and, and, and that's a really good, you know, you, know, you wanna have sort of that baseline based on what do they do today and what performance does it result in uh, as, as another baseline. Yeah, and when we think about performance here, something we'll come back to a lot, right, is, you know, that, that's kind of performance, both in terms of sort of accuracy, but also sort of fairness, right? And, and so kind of the compared to current practice, compared to some sort of baseline, um, is something that you should be thinking about, not just for, you know, precision, right. but also for, for fairness. And, and many other metrics, right? You might care about stability. If you're going to interview yeah. with people over time, you, want, you don't want a completely new list. You also want maybe interpretability. So, so I think you know when we talk about performance, there's sort of a multiple objectives there, and, and for each problem, we'll define that. Sometimes it's accuracy related. Sometimes it's interpretability, stability, fairness, efficiency. If you're running this for lots of people all the time, it has to be retrained every hour. Then it might be computational efficiency, or if you have limited, you know, you're doing something on device on a camera, and then you have limited computational resources, memory. So all sorts of things can, can you know, like, um, and you want to have sort of this type of framework for, for baselines for, for, for all of these. Um, one last one. So we kind of covered a, a few, right? We sort of said, what's your, we're going to, we're calling random, but it's really your, your prior. Um, and we said, well, what's sort of the common sense version, which is, well, what if we just looked at sorted people by the number of times uh, they've, they've been in jail before? Um, or understanding what they actually do today as another, and implementing that as a baseline. Um, but before we go and sort of build, you know, complicated models, whether it's neural networks or even random forests or other things, you know, what is something that's really simple that we could build and how, how much benefit are we getting by having a much, much, much heavy weight machinery versus, you know, a couple of different small number of small features, a very simple, interpretable, understandable model, right? So, so we're gonna sort of ask you to build that as another baseline. Um, and, and a simple sort of heuristic or a proxy for that might be, uh, you know, one or two deep uh, decision tree. Um, because that's something that they could understand. They might even build today uh, some version of that. Again, not using any machine learning algorithms, but um, so, so that's another kind of simple, what's a very simple, because you could sort of argue logistic regression might be that model and you should also use that. Um, but also something, you know, regression will still require them to do some deeper analysis. But if they were just sort of using a couple of heuristic decisions, then, then this might be a way to approximate what those might result in. Um, yeah. Yeah. With, with the kind of the one caveat and, and challenge with, you know, if you do like a, uh, one or two deep, right? If you do a two deep decision tree, you end up with four buckets. Um, and so if they have, you know, if there are 10,000 people in the, in the cohort, they have resources to intervene on a on hundred of them, your highest score bucket, you know, might have 2000 people in it or something like that. Um, and then you, and then what, right? And, and so, you know, then are you sorting them by, by something? Or are you just choosing at random? Um, you know, so, so it, it, it can be useful, but you have to put a little bit of thought into um, what, you know, what would they do at that point, right? They, they have some criteria. So, you know, usually you use a decision tree as, well, they just have some criteria that somebody meets, but then if the number of people that meet that criteria exceeds their, their resources to intervene, uh, what are they going to do at that point? Um, and it may be random, maybe sorting by something. Um, so it's it's good not just to build a, a too deep decision tree and and stop there because that's probably not a great reflection of of what they would do today. Um, it might be kind of a, a first step. Yep. Yeah. And I think you know in general I think again if the problem is uh, prioritize something then then you know Kit's point is really important is you can't really prioritize people if you have a very simple uh, uh, categorized model of some sort, right? Where you have sort of four, four places. So, so kind of this sorting by something. If you're dealing with schools, sorting, you know, if you're looking at the projects, right? So, so thinking about each of your projects, what would you sort? If you had to sort by one thing, uh, 
that would get you highest risk students up front or highest risk voters up, up the top or highest risk facilities or highest risk bills. What is that one attribute? What is, or two attributes or three attributes? What are those? And, and again, that's a lot of, you know, just looking at the data, doing some data exploration, looking at which attributes of the data of the students, the bills, the facilities, the voters um, correlate with uh, the outcome, the label, right? Like that, you can, you, can, you can have an idea. So you don't have to kind of make up these things. You can look at research and you can look at the data and the combination of those give you a lot of these baselines. Um, and it's, this work is worth doing again for two reasons. One is you want to show and you want to sort of have your work that you're doing, you know, show that it's better than in all these simple or existing things. But also this work directly feeds into your feature generation process because all of these will go in as features. Uh, I mean, not the random one, but uh, hopefully you're not putting in random features. Um, but everything else is also going to be the, a feature in your model. So, so it's, not, it's not, you know, extra work. It's, it's part of your, the rest of the process. Um, yeah, so some things to kind of keep in mind, right, is, is based on these baselines. How much better should you be on each of these in order for you to recommend that, that the system should be deployed? Um, that's something to sort of think about. Um, um, and, you know, we've already sort of mentioned this several times. Um, it's, it's important to kind of make sure um, com you compare performance against against both of these things um, and, and the sorting thing, right? It's, you should be able to sort people because if you have ties, then in practice, the only thing you can do with a tie is randomly select a smaller set because uh, there's, you know, there's no other way to, to, to break the ties. And so having a sorting function, think of it as a regression tree, right? That's kind of what it does uh, is, is it's, that's, it gets built as a decision tree and then a delete node, you're, you're doing a regression. Just, to get in a more accurate estimate, this is, this is a similar idea. You could apply that, um, and and this is going to be depressing, um, but you're going to find that in many many real world problems, um, it may be really hard to beat uh, a, a good baseline. It's happened many times where this it, this you know th what happened last time or has happened to you before is going to happen again type baseline becomes really difficult to beat. Um, and, and that's fine. I mean, it's, it's, it, it might be a reflection of the data that you have. You don't have enough data. Um, but you want to sort of make sure that it's happening because you've done, you know, that, that you've done everything you can and you've tested all the different things you could test, right? So if you build a model with three features and you say, oh, I can't beat random baseline, well, that's not enough. Or if you build two models and say, well, I had three features and I had two models and none of them could beat my baseline. Well, that's not, that doesn't show that you can't beat the baseline, but it shows that you haven't done enough, enough work yet. So that's kind of what we're gonna do over the rest of the semester, right? Is kind of tell you what's the, what help you figure out what that effort is that you have to put in. Um, what are the different things you have to try before you can sort of say, well, we just don't have enough information to tackle this problem with, with these types of methods. Um, but, but you're gonna find that, you know, for many problems it's gonna be difficult to beat, but, but if you put in the right methodology and the, and the, and the, and, and the right work, you're gonna find that you, you'll often be able to beat that, um, not in the first week, not in the first two weeks, but it's gonna take some time. And that's again, you know, um, uh, a lesson that, that you learn over time as you work on these real projects is that your first results are gonna be pretty horrible. If they're very good, then there's a bug in your code. Um, and so you're gonna expect the first few uh, iterations of your models not to be that great compared to baseline. Um, and then you're gonna start, you know, as you fix all the bugs, you're gonna sort of see really great performance in the beginning. It's gonna be a bug. It's gonna dip down to be pretty horrible but it'll be correct. And then you're gonna come back up as you start doing better and better things. So that's kind of a typical, uh, I don't know if you, if you measured your, your metric over time of, uh, over the project, that's what you're gonna see. Yeah, generally we're gonna be more worried about the projects that have like 99%, you know, kind of performance uh, 
off the bat than the, the ones that have, you know, uh, just a little bit better than, than random sort of performance off the bat. Yeah, so I think that's kind of most of the stuff we had for, for baseline. But, but again, what we want you to do for projects is step one is really the formulation. That's going to be the key to move forward and start using ML. Once, and then once you have a formulation based on that formulation, then you have to do the, the baselines. Of what are the baselines that I'm looking at? And, and implementing those baselines first before you even go and build any, any machine learning models because now you've set up the framework so that anytime you build a model, you know whether you're making progress, you know whether it's, it's better than these baselines. And, and any, any features you add in there, any tweaks you do, um, you get that feedback by seeing how much better is it than, than the baseline that I've set up. Yeah, and, and Ray mentioned, I think already, that you know, the, the side benefit of, of going out and building all those baselines first um, is they're often you know, very useful as some of the most important features that you'd want to start with anyway. So you're kind of like building, um, you know, build, building things that, that you'll be able to reuse um, as well as, as compare against.